is a, can everyone hear me? Because I kind of feel muffled. Okay, praise God. Um, so when I was told I was teaching, I was kind of caught at a, as a deer in the headlights. Um, I was eating a hamburger at Pastor and Kate's, and um, I just, you know, nonchalantly asked, who's teaching? And Kate goes, you are. And uh, Pastor was like, yeah, you know, I think it's time. And I just looked at them, and I was like, no. And they were like, yeah. And uh, so I was a little unnerved, and of course, you know, at that moment, I'm like, I know exactly what I'm teaching on, I know exactly what we're going to talk about, and God changed everything. Um, you know, we plan, God laughs. Um, I always hear Rick in my head when I think of things, and I'm like, planning, and I hear him say, we plan, God laughs. Um, I'm a very methodical person. I like to have all my ducks in a row. I like to have everything concise and figured out. And God just did not allow any of that to happen at all. Um, The teaching title changed probably 20 different times. And um, then yours truly did not save said teaching on Monday. And (laughs) I had to reboot my computer because it froze. So everything was gone, everything. And I'm just kind of like, okay, God's got a plan. And then so I walk into pastor's office and he hands me this book. He goes, you need this. And it's a book on boundaries. And I'm like, okay. And he goes, maybe your teaching will change again. I said, well, you know, I just accidentally erased it. So who knows? And um, anyways, it's long story short. It's just kind of how it is. Um, So tonight's teaching kind of stemmed from something that God put in my heart a long time ago. Um, A lot of you know, a lot of you don't know, but this last year has kind of been hell for me. Um, And it's been a season of excruciating pain. It's been a season of realizing so many things about where I went wrong, what I've done, how I could have been more in tune with God to hear what he wanted me to do instead of my own will and my own reasoning and my own plans. And, um, you know, a lot of times we get caught up in what we want And it causes a lot of problems. And things may look good. They may look like God, but they're not God. If something is started on a foundation and a base of a lie or a base of compromise or a base of inconsistency, it is not God. Okay? And it took me a long time to figure that out Um, in a lot of painful circumstances. But when you come to a place where you allow pain to teach you instead of trying to numb it or trying to run from it, you enter into a whole different arena. Pain can be a very powerful teacher, but you have to let God do the work and not try to fix it yourself. And um, so tonight's teaching is really kind of called um, Building Blindly, and it stems from a compromised heart, um, which is sin sickness. And um, I love to glean. Um, I'm a gleaner. I love uh, listening to different teachings. I listen to Damon Thompson, Paul Washer. Um, I really like re-listening to pastors' teachings because there's a lot of times you can hear something again and again, and it gives you a new message and a new teaching each and every time. And that's how it is for me. I re-listen to the same thing probably 20 or 30 times just because it gives me new insight. It gives me new feedback. It gives me the ability to kind of um, enter into a whole new level with it. So if you guys have teachings you like, I encourage you to listen to them again and again because chances are God's trying to get you deeper and deeper and to another level in him. Um, So a lot of what I'm going to be talking about stems from my own personal experiences. Um, I really, really, really love words. Um, I love antonyms and synonyms and definitions, and I love to just kind of dive in and go deep. So when I was starting the teaching um, of Building Blindly, I really looked up the word for blind. And so I kind of want you to place it in, uh, kind of substitute it in, but when you're building blindly, you are destitute of vision. You are undiscerning, you are visionless, and unsighted. So when you're building with destitute of vision, or undiscerning, or visionless, you're walking in complete assumption. You've got no direction from God. God is not in it. And um, I want to turn to Proverbs 29, 18. Please, we're going to start there. I know it's in order. This is not my Bible. So that's Proverbs 29, 18. (laughs) 
Is everyone there? Amen? Hallelujah. Okay. Um, so it, Proverbs 29, 18 says, Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraints, but happy is he who keeps the law. So where there is no revelation, there's no vision. People cast off restraint. Vision is also a synonym for the word revelation. And restraint also means holding back or controlling or checking. Caution, constraint, self-control, moderation. But the main thing I want you guys to take away is self-discipline. So restraint is self-discipline. So where there is no vision, you cannot be self-disciplined. And when you're not restrained, uh, an antonym for self-disciplined is self-indulgent. So when you are not restrained, when you don't have that revelation, the only thing that matters is what you want, when you want it, how you want it, and it has to happen. And so, um, it, yeah, you know? Um, so in that, with me and my, my own personal life, um, again, I, you know, you overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of your testimony. So you don't go through things just to hold them in and to keep them to yourself. You go through, through things because... Um, Wisdom is learning by other people's mistakes. Kate has always emphasized that to me, and it's a big thing. If you're going to learn something, don't go through it. Learn from somebody else's making a huge mistake. And I don't want to say that in that time my relationship was a mistake. My relationship was a beautiful thing, but it started off with the basis of a lie. It started off in deception. And even though God can work all things to the good, do you really want to spend your lifetime working out something, going through trials, going through tumultuous situations and circumstances because I'm going to share something with you guys. If somebody is willing to break their covenant up with God for you, they're willing to betray you for the next high. They're willing to betray you for the next person. They're willing to betray you for the next situation that comes across their path. They are not loyal. They operate with a spirit of betrayal. And it is a huge thing. You have to really understand that covenant with God is first. You have to keep that covenant. But if you pester God enough, he will give you what you want. And that's going to lead us to, we're going to go to 1 Samuel. So in the process of um, coming here tonight, I left all of my notes at home. I left my Bible at home. <laughs> and so I, had a, I came here, and then I had to turn around and go back and go get everything. So praise God. It's been a very highly blessed. Uh, yeah, 1 Samuel 8. And we're going to actually read verses 4 through 21. And if you guys look at the little he header here, it says, Israel demands a king. So Israel wanted a king. Um, they weren't content with what they had. They wanted something tangible. They wanted something that they could see. They wanted something that could be, they wanted to be like everybody else, okay? So a lot of times we pursue things because we want what everybody else has. We want a relationship. We want a, a job that pays more money. We want to have this. We want to have that. And we get so caught up in the thing of obtaining, of obtaining that thing, that we lose sight of who actually gives it to us and who brings it to pass. So I want to start at verse 4. Is everyone there? Amen. Okay. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, and I should not reign over them according to all the works which they have done since the day I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day with which they have forsaken me and served other gods. So they are doing to you also. Now therefore heed their voice. However, you shall solemnly forewarn them and you shall show them the behavior of the king who will reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who asked him for their king. And he said, this will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for his own chariots and to be his horsemen. And some will run before his chariots. He will appoint captains over his thousands and captains over his fifties. He will set some to plow his ground and reap his harvest 
and some to make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks, and bakers, and he will take the best of your fields, your vineyards, and your olive groves, and he will give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your grain and your vintage and give it to his officers and servants, and he will take your male servants and your female servants, your finest young men and your donkeys, and put them to his work. He will take a tenth of your sheep, and you will be his servants, and you will cry out in that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, No, but we will have a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may, be judge, may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And, okay. and Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he repeated them in the hearing of the Lord. So the Lord said to Samuel, Heed their voice and make them a king. And Samuel said to the men of Israel, Every man go to his city. Um, so in this, the people demanded a king. They have not, and he, the Lord says, They have not rejected you, they have rejected me. And then verse 18 says, You will cry out in that day because the king whom you have chosen for yourselves, the plan, the person, the job that you have chosen for yourselves, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. So I kind of want to emphasize to you guys that they weren't content. There was no um, depth. They wanted something, again, tangible. Let me tell you something. When you really get to know him, he's tangible. When you really have that relationship, he is everything. And people don't understand. You guys, and I, I love everybody here, but you guys come in here and you think, I've got a plan. I'm going to do nine months and I'm going to hightail it out of here and I'm going to get back to my life. Wrong. When you come in here, you are now accountable for every single thing that you know in here. And it is your job to reach the world. It is not your job to come in here and to play cookie cutter religion and to sit in the chair and read the words and hold your hands and just kind of be there. Your job is to fight. Your job is to intercede. Your job is to call people out of darkness and to be an example. And too many times we get caught up with wanting to do our own will, with wanting to do our own way of thinking, and it's got to stop. It really grieves me. Like, it grieves me to no end. I, I, I can't go there yet, but we're going to go there. Anyways. Um, so I was going to continue in Samuel, but I think you all kind of get the point. Anyways, so Samuel gets, anoint, gets appointed king. And um, actually, I guess we will go there. Um, yeah, we will. Let's go to 1 Samuel uh, 15, verses 10 through 13. Actually, no, we're going to go to 1 Samuel, sorry, 15, 1 through 9. Is everyone there? Amen. <laughs> Amen. Um, so Samuel said to Saul, The Lord has sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Talam, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul said to the Kenites, Go depart, go get down from among the Amalek, ugh, Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites, and Saul attacked the Amalekites from Havilah, all the way down to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings of the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless, that they utterly destroyed. So in this, prior to, you know, the Lord said to utterly destroy everything. Now, 
Saul thought that he was doing the will of God, but he wasn't listening to God anymore. Saul couldn't hear. Okay? So because Saul had what was called a compromised heart, it wasn't the greed that was the problem. It was the compromised heart that was the problem. Because as soon as your heart is compromised, you can't hear God. So, um, I love Damon Thompson. Um, He is one of my favorite pastors, teachers. I listen to his stuff over and over again. And um, he did a similar um, example with Judas, um, which we're not going to go there. But he talks about how Judas's issue wasn't the greed. It was the compromised heart. He walked with Jesus, yet he betrayed him with a kiss. He sold him out for silver, but at the end, he ended up hanging himself. Okay? So Judas was a betrayer. Saul was a betrayer. But it stemmed from a compromised heart. It didn't stem from greed. Because, see, when your heart is compromised, the only thing you care about is the tangible and the materialism of the world. So um, it continues on, and it, it talks about obedience is better than sacrifice. So to obey God, to obey his voice, to obey his commands, to obey the calling, to obey the rules in this place, guys, it's better than sacrifice. Quit bucking. Start bowing. It doesn't mean you're going to have a perfect leader. It doesn't mean you're going to have a perfect office personnel. It, it doesn't mean that you're going to have perfection. It means that God's looking to see where your obedience is in spite of the dysfunction around you. He's looking to see where your heart's at. He's looking to see, are you willing to do whatever it takes? Are you willing to go the extra mile? Are you willing to endure this person not liking you and that person having an attitude and this person stealing all the milk and this person eating all the Cheerios? Like, it's... It's such, it's such idiocracy, guys. It really is. Like, it's not anything that merits anything valuable. It's all just stupidity. And it has to stop. I mean, mind you, we're in a, you know, you're in a confined place, so it's easy to get upset over the little things. But don't let the little things take away from the bigger picture of what's going on here. And, I mean, in true reality, every single person, and this is the thing that really gets me, I talk to every single one of you before you get here. I know where everyone's coming from. I understand the pits and the depths of the pain that you were in. And then you get here, and after a couple of weeks, you think everything's fine. You think everything's hunky-dory. You think everything should be given to you. And I'm not saying that, you know, God doesn't want to give you guys stuff or, you know, give you girls stuff, but he wants you to understand that everything comes with a price. You have to pay the price. You have to pray the price. You've got to walk it out then that's when the blessing comes. It doesn't come instantaneously because you make the decision to do the right thing. It doesn't. It comes because you walk it out. So many times people come in here and they tell me, yes, I'm going to do aftercare. Yes, I'm going to stay. And then they book the day that their their nine months hits. It's like, uh, what happened? And then 95% of the time, like two months later, they're in jail because they can't maintain. You cannot expect nine months to suffice for umpteenth years of you doing the wrong thing. Okay, so in this, um, we don't want to build blindly. And building our own lives, when we're calling something God and it's not, is building blindly. And this is the whole thing. So what initially started my whole teaching was um, months ago. I was going through a really, really bad day. Um, It was a Sunday service. It was a really rough time. And um, my husband was at the time, was sitting next to Kate, and I was really, really infuriated. Like, I was really going through it. And I was over there in the corner, and they, uh, Jen Johnson's song, Overwhelmed, was playing. And all of a sudden, I hear the words, truly, madly, deeply. I'm like, oh my gosh. I started repenting immediately, because I'm thinking it's, you know, a Savage Garden song from, like, way back when. And I'm like, God, I bind my mind to the mind of Christ. I repent. Like, I was sitting here just really, like, tormented that I was thinking about this song and the Lord was like just listen to me truly madly deeply and so I initially thought that that was what was going to be what we spoke about and it wasn't um but it it is the antidote for building blindly so it's the antidote 
and the antidote is a substance that can counterattack a form of poisoning. And when you are building blindly, you are walking in a life of poison. You are poisoned to yourself. You are poisoned to everybody else. You are poisoned to people you don't need to be poisoned to. Because this is the thing, guys. You don't realize that all eyes are on you. Everyone's watching you. Everybody either is waiting for you to fail or to mess up or to go backwards or to do the wrong thing again or to do the right thing. And when you don't meet their expectations, it poisons their opinion and their perception of you. And it, it's a rough thing. I mean, I was with somebody who was clean for almost four years, and then one day they made the decision to go out and use, and my whole world fell apart. But the whole thing was is it wasn't that one day. Their heart was compromised months prior to. Because before you walk out a sinful act, your heart's already darkened. And it's been darkened for a long time. You just choose that day to make that decision. And so my world came crashing down. But you know what? In that, that whole circumstance, I value everything that I went through because it brought me to a relationship with God where there is no compromise. There is no second guessing. There is no walking out of his will. It is him and him alone. And anything else that tries to come at that, that protective sanction that I have can't touch it. It can't. And that's how every single one of us in this room needs to be. It's not about getting married and building your life. It's not about going back home and having a white picket fence and sitting in a church pew and having 30 minutes of praise and worship and then going home and going about your lives. Every single person in this room is an arsenal. Like, I don't think you realize, like, you guys have been through the depths of hell and you have a testimony. And too many times Satan is trying to get you to taint your testimony. So, truly, madly, deeply. Um, we're going to go back to that. We're going to backtrack here. Um, the first one is to truly hate sin. And um, Paul Washer says, the true love of God means true hatred of sin. You can't say you love God and approve of the things that he abhors. It doesn't work that way. And um, I want to go to Romans 16, verses 17 through 20. This one I have written down, so I don't need to, you know, it's not going to take me time to get there. So just let me know when y'all are ready. Amen? Amen. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For those are such that do not serve the Lord Jesus Christ but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has become known to all, therefore I am glad on your behalf. But I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. So in that, if you truly love God, you're not going to be associating with people who gossip. You're not going to be associating with people who slander. You're not going to be associating with people who are in the world. Now, does it mean shun them? No. You want to be a light. You want to be an example. You want to be somebody that people know that they can reach out to when they're going through something. But you do not want to sit and have tea and have coffee with people that are going to taint your walk with Christ. And it's a big thing. And I know for myself, there are certain people that call me all the time, hey, I need your help, hey, I need this, I, I think I need to come to the program, yada, yada, yada. And eventually it comes to a point where it's like, you know what, show me. Quit telling me you want to come to the program and start coming to service. Start showing me this is what you want. As opposed to, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry you're going through this. Let's talk about it for the umpteenth time and go around that same mountain and not progress and get anywhere. Quit associating with people that are going to hinder the walk or your walk with God, because bad company corrupts good habit, good character. And too many times we compromise in the area of our associations because we think we're witnessing to somebody. Let me tell you something. You witness by your walk. You witness by the way that you worship. You witness by what comes out of your mouth. If you're sitting there and touching and agreeing and gossip and you're calling yourself a Christian and calling yourself being the light for somebody, you can't be the light and gossip at the same time. You can't be the light and speak bad about your sister next to you. How about pray for that person? How about pray for your brother that's fallen instead of 
of telling everyone about what's happening to them. It's so mind-boggling to me how we call ourselves, it's given the church such a bad name. It really has. If you know your, your brother or your sister's in a, a situation of sin, don't tell everybody about it. Pray for them. Go to them. Say, hey, look, the Lord's kind of revealing this to me. You know, maybe you should look at this. But you're not going to go and sit there and talk with Susie about Mary and, and so on and so forth. It's not edifying. And all you're doing is contaminating yourself. It's got to stop. And it's really grieving. You know, a lot of people today, I got a message from somebody that said, hey, I haven't heard from you in a really long time. Are you doing okay? And I said, yeah, God just has me set apart. I was tired of everything I told that person coming back to me from four different people. I was tired of it. I'm, I don't know about y'all, but I'm in a place where I don't want anything to distract me from God's will. I don't. And if it becomes a distraction, it gets shut down. And that's what we all need to realize here. You guys in the houses especially, because it's easy to get frustrated with living with so many people. Trust me, I know. I lived in the girl's house. Susan can attest to it. We had a full house. It was not easy. But too many times there's cattiness and there's nastiness when a simple prayer with your brother will alleviate a lot. Or a simple prayer with your sister will alleviate a lot. But don't sit there and talk about each other. It's, it's not right. And it's got to stop. Um, so I want to talk to you guys about what you feed grows and what you starve dies. So we're still on the topic of truly hating sin, okay? So when you, I want you to kind of envision yourself, uh, you being the knot in the middle of a tug of, tug of war. And every time that you, you've got righteousness and you've got unrighteousness on either side. Every time you make a decision to feed your flesh, you are adding strength to unrighteousness. Every time you make a decision to feed your spirit, you are adding strength to the righteous side. And it's literally a game. And what you feed will grow. What you starve will die. If you want righteousness to be overtaken in your life, you need to feed your spirit man. If you completely and continually feed uh, your old man, essentially, you're going to fall back into old tendencies, old ways, and eventually it's going to move you right out of position. So in that, you got to look at where your time is at, where are your affections set towards, where are your finances going? Too many times I see this happening. Everybody, you know, it's nice to have nice things. I'm not going to say it's not. You know, I, I like things. I like jewelry. But at the end of the day, your first fruits better be to God's kingdom. You better be sowing. You better be tithing. You better be offering. And it's not just a minimum. You should be giving the maximum amount that you can. Reason being because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What, it, what, what is it profit having all of these things that are going to burn up anyways? When you can make a way for somebody else to hear a teaching or to receive uh, a place in the program. or I mean, it just, it's, it's really mind-boggling to me. And servitude. This is the thing, guys. When you are here, don't look at it as an obligation. Look at it as a privilege. You want to serve. You want to be hands and feet to expand God's kingdom. It's not about what you guys can do for yourselves anymore. It's about what you can do for him. And it really, it, that's another thing that kind of lights a fire under me. I see so many people that say, oh, well, I want to serve God and I want to do the right thing, but oh, you know what, I'm going to go out to lunch instead. You want to serve God? Take that time that you're going out to lunch and pray. Intercede. Fast. I cannot begin to tell you, and I'm not telling you guys anything that I'm not currently doing, because then I would be a hypocrite. But it's the truth. Too many times we're building our own kingdoms. And then we get upset with God when, it, when things happen and when things falter. So, second thing is going to be um, madly pursue righteousness. And madly pursuing righteousness is twofold. You're pursuing righteousness the person, and you're pursuing living a life of righteousness. And so, I like, again, words. So I looked up synonyms for the word righteousness. That is noble, virtuous, ethical, pure, conscientious, upright, honorable, law-abiding, blameless, charitable, so on and so forth. And in that, you want to pursue a life of nobility. You want to pursue a life of living in such a way people know that if they're going through something that they can call you. 
You don't want to be the person that they call to talk about Susie. You want to be the person that they call to pray for Susie. Okay? And too many times, things are flip-flopped. Um, Psalm 34:15 says, The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. So if you're madly pursuing righteousness, what you pursue, you will become like. So if you're pursuing the things of the world, you're going to become like the world. If you're pursuing things of righteousness, you're going to become and enter into more righteousness. And there are levels, guys. It's not just like a one-size-fits-all. There are levels, and there's depths, and there's areas. You get deeper and deeper and deeper, and you start to hate sin more and more and more and more. You hate the gossip. You hate the materialism. You hate the TV. Like, I haven't watched TV in about a month, and it has been the most freeing thing I have gone through. Because I used to, I'm not going to even lie, I used to be a binge watcher on Netflix. I loved hours and hours of shows. I'd watch it while I worked. I did all of this stuff, and it profited me nothing. It was just senseless hours I will never get back, ever. And I look at it, and I'm like, and I rewatched the same thing over and over and over again. And I really, for me, I was just like, oh, well, you know, I've seen it 50 million times, why not once more? But instead, I've shifted my focus, and I've been doing teachings, and I've been reading the Word, and I've been getting into God's presence more, and it has completely shifted so much in my life. Because essentially, I do the right thing. You know, I'm at the ministry. My life is the ministry. I mean, I don't do anything else aside from there. I go home, I pet my rabbit, I come back to the office. It's a pretty, you know, simple life I live. And I don't really do anything wrong, but there's a wrongness in not doing anything right. So you may not be partaking in grave acts of sin, but your heart's not on fire. And your heart has to be on fire. You have to be in a state of madness. Like, that's the only way I can, I can describe it. You are mad about God. You are mad. You are overwhelmingly captivated by his presence and by his works and by his ways. And that's what you have to be like. That's how you have to be. If you find yourself more entertained with what's on TV than you are with God's presence, you got a heart check. You really need to check your heart and you really need to see where you're at. It's the same thing with, gosh, fishing. It's the same thing with video games. It's the same thing with sports. It's the same thing with the gym. Because for a while, I was going to the gym every single day, and I was finding fulfillment in the gym, which I love the gym, but it's not my fulfillment. He's my fulfillment. He has to be your fulfillment. If he's not your fulfillment, you're chasing after another God. And let me tell, tell you something, and this is kind of, it might hit, you know, might make some people mad, but if you're a parent Get things right with your kids before you pursue a freaking relationship. I'm sorry, but it really, it's something that really kind of gets to me because I love children and I have been in a home without another parent and it is a very hard thing for a child. So if you have an opportunity to be an active member in your child's life, pursue that, get that relationship solid and then let God build the house from then on out. But if that's not your priority, you're out of order. You are completely out of order. And I love y'all, and that's why I say it. I mean, I, I love children, and it really, really grieves me. And it's one thing that, in my circumstance, that really grieved me when, with everything I went through because that wasn't a priority for him. Do I know he loved his kids? Absolutely. But I was a false fulfillment for him, and it caused a lot of things to go out of God's timing because that one area should have been perfected before anything started with us. A lot of other areas should have been perfected, but it wasn't the case. And I wasn't willing to bow. That's the thing. I was building what I wanted. I was doing what I thought was right. Children are a gift from God. And if God has entrusted you with one, you honor that. And you make sure that is a priority for your life. So, um, I want to go to Matthew 5 verses 1 through 12. And this is um, kind of a guideline to maintaining righteousness. It is the Beatitudes, and I love them. There's actually a song about the Beatitudes. I forget who sings it, but it's one of my favorites.
Is everyone there? Amen. All right. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on the mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they should obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So in that, when you pursue righteousness, you are going to be persecuted. People are not going to understand you. My family does not understand me. I mean, my mom understands me. But, and even my sister kind of understands me. She's really cute. She, um, you know, she lives a very worldly lifestyle. But around me, she's very, she doesn't curse. She doesn't vape. She doesn't do anything she shouldn't be doing. She's very mindful of my walk. But for a long time, it really kind of got to her. But over time, she saw my consistency. And in that, she's changed around me. And that's a big thing. When people really see your consistency, they don't want to hinder your walk. They want to be um, a positive additive to your walk. And if they're not, it's because you've given them the impression that they can do those things around you. And that's not right. So um, the third thing is to deeply love Jesus. And this is, I think, my favorite part because I really, really love Jesus. I really do. Um, you know, the song, So Will I, is a very, like, I don't know how to explain it, but there's just something about that song that really just melts my heart. And I love it because I just, it, it literally, it really melts my heart. I went through a really, going through my really dark time. It was right after um, the whole process started. And um, it was last it was August of 2018. Um, actually, one of the brothers that were here before brought the song to Pastor, and Pastor was like, hey, listen to this, see if it's, you know, Friday Night Material, and if, it's, if it is, let's get it ready. And um, so I listened to it, and I sent it back to Pastor. I was like, yeah, this is a really good song. But I listened to the song probably 40 times that day because it broke something inside of me that I had a hardness of. And I love God but I didn't know really what it meant to be so in love with him that I was willing to forsake anything else. And even in that time, I was still willing to compromise because I wanted what I wanted. I didn't care how he came back as long as he came back and he came back to me. And that was wrong. I didn't ask God's opinion of what he wanted me to do in the circumstance. And that's what building blindly is. When you're not asking God's opinion, when you're not seeking his face for every decision that you have to make, you are building blindly in your life. And it is a very dangerous place to be. And I can't emphasize that enough. Like it really, I can't. And I really wish I could because I've been there. And I know the trouble you get into when you try to walk in your own will. And when you try to do things according to your own way. And it's a big hindrance, not just to you, but to everyone around you. Because the whole circumstance was a big hindrance to everybody around us. I mean, I thank God for Pastor and Kate because they really saw the situation through and they helped me do things that I wasn't able to do that they you know and they were there for me so in that make sure you cling to the people that are consistent and that are your spiritual leaders don't try to be a lone ranger in that you have spiritual leaders for a reason you have people that are ahead of you you've got David you've got Carlin you've got um, pastor you have Kate utilize that they love you they're here for you and they're going to give you sound advice. They're not going to give you emotional advice. They're not going to tickle your ear. They're not going to tell you what you want to hear. They're going to give it to you straight. And sometimes you're going to get really angry. You really will. But in hindsight, they want the best for every single one of us in this room. They're our shepherds. And they do. They want the best for us in here. So you really should, before, again, making any decision, A, consult the Lord, but also make sure you get confirmation on what you're doing. So, deeply love Jesus. 
I want you guys to look at this like you're in a marriage with the Lord. And with God, he is a treasure. You've got to look at him like he's everything you've ever wanted. And I want to emphasize this to you guys. Until your relationship with your beloved is like a marriage, only then are you in a position to think about marriage, ladies and gentlemen. Um, when you're in love and you're married to the Lord, you don't think, look at things, like I said before, like obligations. You look at them like opportunities. You look at them like privileges. I don't come in here and look at my clock and be like, oh, man, we're in an hour of worship. No, I'm blessed we get an hour of worship. When I first started the playlist for, for tonight, I had two and a half hours and I had to cut it back because, you know, we can't be here for two and a half hours in worship. I wish we could have, but, but that's, that, that was me. Like, I, you can't get enough. When you're in love with somebody, when you're in love with someone, if you look at it like that, you can't get enough of them. You enjoy their presence. You enjoy their quirks. You enjoy all the things that kind of get under your skin. You enjoy those things. And you should be that way about the Lord. You should enjoy the chastisements. You should enjoy the areas where he says, this is a boundary you need not to cross. Because boundaries protect your relationship. They keep it sanctified. They keep it set apart. They keep it in a sense of, um, just a oneness and a closeness. You know, you're not going to be in a relationship with somebody or a marriage with somebody and talk to another woman, I would hope not, or another man. So if you're in a relationship with God, why are you talking to the devil? When you truly fall in love, it's not an I have to, it's an I want to. Christianity is only hard because you're not in love with Jesus. That's the only reason it's hard. Following the ways of the Lord and not sinning is only hard because you haven't reached that level of love. And abiding by his word is only hard because you aren't in love. So when you're in love, you don't care how long service lasts. You don't care how many songs are sung. You don't count time. And that's another thing. In the program, you don't count time. When you're really in love with Jesus, you look at it as, man, I get to be in a place where I'm set apart. I don't have to think about a job. I don't have to think about work. I don't have to think about anything. I can just be with Jesus. And you get to pursue that relationship. And I watch people take the war room for granted, and it drives me nuts. Enjoy the war room. Please enjoy the war room. I would love to just take a week off and not have to do any work and just be in the war room and learn and be in God's presence. Like people don't understand, like it really is like, you don't, you don't get it. You get frustrated because you're in there for so long, but the grass is always greener. When you start working, you're going to wish you were back in that war room being able to get refreshed on a consistent basis. And it's the truth. Your life, when your life is not your own anymore, that's when you know you're sold out. Stop worrying about your life. Start worrying about his. You know, Paul Washer talks about the Great Commission. And he says, men, we were not made to live like most men. We were made to thrive. We were made to fight. We were made for something greater than our own temporal causes. To pace a room at night saying, there's a place, there's a place where he is not worshipped, where he is not worshipped. There's a place where he is not worshipped. I cannot sleep. There is a place where he is not worshipped. There's a place where the flag of Zion does not fly. And I listened to that thing over and over and over again until it was so embedded and ingrained in me that there are times I wake up in the middle of the night and I know I am supposed to be praying. And you should be in that same, your relationship with God should be in that same place to where you wake up in the middle of the night. It's not, oh man, I can't sleep. It's, I need to go pray. I need to seek what God wants me to do in this circumstance. Because if not, you're relying on your own carnal strengths. You're relying on your own thinking. And that's not what God has called us to be. If God wanted us to be a, a pew sitter and just sit in church for 30 minutes, we would be there. We would not be in this room. And trust me, I have tried to run from God my whole life. I have tried to plan my life out to now where I don't want to plan. I just want God to be God. And that's why he continually allows things to not go according to my plan. And it's very frustrating sometimes. I get very, like, aggravated, and I'll sit and I'll cry, and I'm like, Lord, you know, and I'm not a crier, so if I cry, it's really, like, a big thing. And, um, you know, I was talking to a brother in Christ, and I used to be a very uh, spiteful individual, and I used to be very vindictive. I didn't think I was, but after talking to him, I really kind of realized I was. <laughs> and um, 
it wasn't a bad thing. It was a really good conversation that we had. And it was a blessing because had it been a year, a year prior to now, I wouldn't have been in a place to hear that. See, God is going to constantly shape and mold you into his image, likeness, and character. But you can't run from the molding. You can't run from the potter's wheel. It's going to prolong the process. So if you're wanting to be in a place with the Lord, follow his ways. Abide. Quit building your own life. I tried it. It did not work. It did not work at all. And now I'm left with a lot of ramifications from it. And it, again, pain is a really great teacher, but it also helps to break down walls that you've built. And a lot of times, especially people here, myself included, you come in here with so many walls. You don't want to be hurt. You don't want people to see the real you. You're afraid if they see the real you, they're not going to like the real you. And men, you may act like you have a, the weight of, you know, a chip on your shoulder, that you're fine, that you're good. But all that is is masking insecurity. All it is is masking inferiority. It's, you know, I think the most beautiful thing is to be humble and open before the Lord. Not somebody who sits there and has to have everything perfect all the time. It's not reality. And I was bound for a long time thinking that perfection meant that I was great with God. No, my brokenness means I'm good with God because it means that I can't do anything on my own. It means that he's my source and everything else is a resource. And the problem is, is that those walls that you're trying so hard to fight from being broken down, they're the areas that God wants to break through so he can get to you and get you deeper in him. So, um, I want to go to 1 Corinthians 13.4. Short, simple teaching, I think. I don't really know what time it is. I'm going the wrong way. Is everyone there? Amen. So, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will fail. Where there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. So, when you stop building your own life, that's when you grow up. Let God do the building. Quit trying to do it yourself. Because you're only going to make it a mess. And this is, you know, I wanted to talk about Judas and I wanted to talk about, um, you know, different stories in the Bible. But the main thing here, and I'm going to, you know, just reference it. You guys don't have to go there. But in the story of, um, I just drew a blank. Uh, well, maybe I'm not supposed to go there. <laughs> um, in the story of, of um, Sarah and her having and bearing a son, um, God gave Sarah a word, and it didn't happen according to her time. So she went outside of God's will, and she made it happen. Too many times, we make things happen, and it produces a counterfeit. And so a counterfeit was produced. Mind you, her promise was still fulfilled by God because God is loving and he's merciful. But now you have a counterfeit and the blessing. And they're at war with one another. You can't have and be in position for God's promise if you're chasing after a counterfeit. And you can't move ahead of God in pursuing a counterfeit because you're not willing to wait on him to bring to pass the promise. And that's what happens too many times. We're afraid that God's not going to do what he says he's going to do. He's going to do it, but in his timing. He moves according to his time. And if it's not his time, it's not his will. And that's where you need discernment. But you won't have discernment if 
your heart's compromised. It's a sin sickness. It's not the, again, the greed, the money, the materialism. It's all stemmed from a compromised heart. And it all stems from you taking the keys back from God and saying, I got this. You don't have anything. Our best decision is serving him. That's all we can do. He does everything else. He establishes everything else. But too many times, we're building our own kingdoms. And you know what? Each and every one of them, not build it on the foundation of him, will crumble. Stop trying to do it yourself. And learn. Learn from other people's mistakes. If you can come in here and not press in in worship, there is something seriously wrong with your heart. And I don't mean that in a rude way. I mean that in a way to hopefully kind of shake some of you up. Worship is what you make it. It is not about a man. It is not about a song. It is not about a feeling. Worship is a way of life. If you want the presence of God, seek the presence of God. He will meet you there. But too many times, oh, well, that's not a good song. Or I don't like what they played. Or I'm tired. Listen, I'm tired all the time. I really am. But you know what? I still love the presence of God. And whether it's Brownsville playing or Parachute Land playing or old school Terry McAlman playing or Freddie Haler playing or Bethel playing, I love God's presence. And there is something in each and every one of those songs to be ministered to and to be ministered with. And that's the thing. You cannot chase words. You can't chase lyrics. You can't chase limericks. You can't chase a feeling. It's not about a feeling. It's about a presence, and it's about his presence. And it has to be all about him. So you have to truly hate evil, madly pursue righteousness, and deeply love him. Otherwise, you're going to consistently and continually to build blindly and live a life of a compromised heart. So I want to close at Jude 20 through 25, please. Twenty through twenty-five. Yes. Yeah. Everyone there? Amen. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And on some have compassion, making a distinction. But others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both for now and forever. Amen. Amen? So, praise God. Father, we come to you, Lord. We thank you. Father, we thank you for pulling us out of darkness and into light. And we just ask, Lord, that you would cause us to truly, truly seek after your heart in all things, Lord. Father, we thank you for every opportunity we get to come into to learn and to be about your presence and to be about your will and your spirit, Lord. And I just ask that you would impart in us a desire to be righteous, a desire to pursue righteousness, and a desire to hate evil. And Father, we thank you. Lord, we can't thank you enough. And we just, we give you all glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.